Thank you. Thank you to all the participants for joining us today. I'm Andrea Coyne, Manager of Elections at the Town of Oakville. With me tonight is Vicki Titanic, Town Clerk, Antonia Mancuso, Elections and Special Projects Coordinator, and Maria Radomirovic, Elections Officer. Today's information session is geared towards registered candidates or those thinking about registering as a candidate for office on, of mayor, councillor, regional chair, or school board trustee. Whether or not you have made up your mind about running for an elected position, we hope the session will provide useful takeaways. Your interest in this session shows you are actively engaged in your community, and I applaud you for that. Municipal and regional governments are closely connected with and impact residents, businesses, and organizations. Oakville as we know it today is rich in the history and modern traditions of many First Nations, Inuit and Métis, from the lands of the Anishinaabe to the Attawandaran and the Haudenosaunee. These lands surrounding the Great Lakes are steeped in First Nations history. The town of Oakville is located on Treaty 14 and Treaty 22 lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation the treaty holders for being stewards of this traditional territory. We'll begin tonight's session with general information about the Oakville municipal election, including voting opportunities, scrutineer information, and results reporting. Representatives are here from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing to speak specifically on campaign finances and staff from the town's municipal enforcement services are here to provide information on election signs. Before we begin, please ensure that your username is the name you registered with, as there will be a question and answer period after each section of tonight's presentation. To ask a question, please use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen, and the host will allow you to unmute yourself, or you may use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type out your question. And as you heard, this meeting is being recorded. If at all you are having any technical difficulties, please don't hesitate to email townclerk at oakville.ca for assistance. Nominations will be accepted until 2 p.m. on Friday, August 19th, which is next week. Please visit the town's election website for complete details and what you'll need to file. Appointments are required to file and candidates for office and council must have at least 25 endorsements from eligible voters. A reminder that individuals must not accept contributions for election campaign purposes or incur expenses until nomination papers have been filed. Myself, Vicki Titanic, and the entire election team is here to support you. Please reach out with any concerns, feedback, or questions you may have. Our contact information is available on the Town Elections website, and I can be reached directly by phone or email. So as I mentioned, the nominations close next week, 2 p.m. on Friday, August 19th. This is the last day an individual may file a nomination for office or withdraw a nomination. The election team will be calling all registered candidates to confirm eligibility and nomination details prior to the 19th. Online voter services will be offered starting September 1st. Eligible voters, those who are Canadian citizen, at least 18 years of age, a resident of Oakville, or the owner or tenant of land in Oakville, or the spouse of such, and not prohibited from voting by law, may check to see if they are on the list and request an addition or amendment as required. Voter information notices will be mailed to eligible electors listed on the voters list around mid-September. Election signs may not be posted prior to September 9th, and as I mentioned, staff from Municipal Enforcement Services are here tonight to provide more details on election signs. Advanced voting will take place at multiple locations during the period of October 6th to the 9th and October 11th to the 15th. And of course, voting day is Monday, October 24th. Voting locations will be open from 10 a.m. until 8 p.m. So for those registered, you are familiar with this but all candidates will be granted access to a candidate portal. This portal not only provides access to resources and documents not otherwise available on our public website, but it also allows candidates to access the voters list. In accordance with the Municipal Elections Act, 
access will not be granted before September 1st. Voters List data will be available through this portal and will allow you to download a new extract of the voters list once a day. And on voting day, you'll be able to download an extract every hour. This means candidates will have access to live updates to the list. It will also allow you to search for a specific elector or search by street name. A reminder that candidates will only have access to the data for eligible electors uh, to vote that are, for those eligible electors uh, that may vote for them. So for example, a candidate for Ward 1 will only have access to Ward 1 elector data. And of course, all registered candidates are required to sign a declaration that they will only use voters list data for election campaign purposes, and that the onus is on the candidate to keep the information confidential. Access to the portal will be terminated at 8pm on Monday, October 24th, which is voting day. We really do hope this online platform will provide additional convenience for candidates. So as many of you already know, Oakville is divided into seven wards. We have implemented a vote anywhere within your ward model on voting day, and there will be 37 voting locations distributed appropriately in each ward. Specific location details to be available as of September 1st. During advanced voting, an eligible elector can cast their ballot anywhere in Oakville, regardless of their ward. Additional locations and increased advanced voting opportunities have been implemented to not only address wait times, but to proactively plan for pandemic response measures. All voting locations will, of course, be physically accessible. Procedures for voting and vote counting equipment are available on the Candidate Resources webpage. A composite ballot is used, which will be issued based on eligible ward and school support. Ballot faces will be posted to the elections website prior to advanced voting, which may help voters familiarize themselves with the ballot prior to visiting a location. Accessible voting equipment will be made available at town hall during all advanced voting dates and on voting day. With this equipment, voters have the option of marking a ballot using the audio accessible ballot marking device. Options include a hand foot paddle, braille hand held device, or a sip and puff device. All election officials are fully trained on their role and will be able to assist voters in any way necessary. There are many ways an eligible elector can vote this upcoming October. This includes voting in person, during advanced voting, voting by proxy or curbside voting, Visit elections.oakville.ca for full details. And a reminder that voters may only vote once in Oakville, in, may only vote once in the Oakville municipal election, regardless of how many properties they own or rent within the town. Throughout your campaign, we ask for your assistance in relaying important information to voters. We ask that you stress the requirement that appropriate identification must be brought to the voting location as well as the importance of voters bringing their voter information on this. Encourage voters to visit our website to ensure that they're on the list. View a complete, a complete list of acceptable identification and for all general voter information. The opportunity to vote is also brought to all assisted senior care homes and long-term care residency. This is what we refer to as reduced hours voting. Election staff will attend these locations for a set time period throughout voting day. Marked ballots from these facilities will be securely stored and transported immediately to the town hall location for processing prior to the close of voting. I'll now turn it over to Antonia Mancusa, Elections and Special Projects Coordinator, to speak to candidate and scrutiny or conduct of voting locations. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Um, so each candidate will be provided with a form to appoint their scrutineers. This, this form is actually now available on your candidate portal that Andrea spoke about earlier. And there is a section in our candidate guide that will speak specifically to this as well. The appointment form is quite detailed and clearly outlines the rules that all candidates and scrutineers must follow. For the purpose of visiting a voting location, candidates and scrutineers are responsible for following the procedures that are outlined in the guide. A candidate and scrutineer are responsible, sorry, a candidate and scrutineer can never be in the same voting location at the same time unless that voting location has two tabulators assigned to it. Should a candidate want to enter a voting location and a scrutineer is their scrutineer in particular is already in, that scrutineer must sign out prior to the candidate signing in and entering the voting location. There is no campaigning 
or signage of any kind permitted at the voting locations with respect to conduct at the voting location, we hope that all staff, voters, candidates, and scrutineers can show mutual respect for one another. It's the election staff's responsibility and priority to administer a fair and transparent election. Voter, candidate, and staff safety is a priority. Additional staff or security will be present, present at locations as required. We ask that all candidates and scrutineers <clears throat> respect town policies and guidelines and conduct themselves in a respectful manner. Failure to do so can and will result in removal from all voting locations. Thank you, Antonia. So results reporting. At the close of voting on October 24th, all voting location doors will be closed. Any voters that were already in line at the voting location will be permitted to vote. Anyone who arrives after 8 p.m. will not be permitted in the voting location and will not be entitled to vote. Any candidate or scrutineer that is in a voting location prior to 8 p.m. is permitted to stay and watch the closing process. Once the results tape is printed, it will be posted on a wall in the location so that the results can be viewed. Staff will continue to close down the voting location and pack up the supplies in accordance with the procedures. Candidates and scrutineers are welcome to stay and watch the closing process, but they will not be permitted to interfere with the process. While this is happening, the results that have been received will be uploaded to the website for viewing and will also be displayed at Town Hall. In an effort to manage expectations, individual location results may not be posted until closer to 9 or 9.30 p.m., but delays must be anticipated. Advanced voting results will be tabulated in the brawny room of Town Hall at 8 p.m. on October 24. Candidates and scrutineers who wish to be present for results printing must be in the rooms prior to 8 p.m. and will be required to show identification and sign in just like any other voting location. It is recommended to arrive well before 8 p.m. to allow sufficient time for the sign-in process as results printing begins sharply at 8 p.m. For the elected candidates, the new term of council begins on November 15th of 2022 and runs through to November 14th of 2026. The inaugural council meeting for the Town of Oakville will take place on Monday, November 21st, 2022. In addition, there will be a council orientation session hosted by the Region of Halton, dates for which will be provided at a later date. As well, the town has an approved COVID-19 vaccination procedure for members of council. Now, before I turn it over to the ministry to speak to uh, campaign finances, I wanted to briefly speak to the town's contribution rebate program available to candidates running for an office on municipal council. For those of you who have already registered and have demonstrated interest in learning more about the program, you, you should be by now familiar with it and we are providing all candidates the necessary resources. Campaign contributions for Ontario municipal election candidates are not eligible for federal or provincial income tax, tax credits. A bylaw was passed to authorize the payment of rebates to eligible individuals who made contributions to candidates for office on the municipal council. Particip participation in the program is voluntary. Candidates must advise us before next Friday, August 19th, if they wish to be registered in the program. The minimum contribution eligible for a 50% rebate is $100 to a maximum of $1,200. The program requires candidates to electronically submit individual contribution information and contributors must then also apply for their rebate. Rebates may only be processed after a candidate files their financial statements in compliance with the Municipal Elections Act and eligible rebates will be paid in September of next year. Necessary information and instructions will be provided upon registering for the program. It is very important that candidates inform their contributors of these rules and ensure that the contributor understands the program requirements, including eligibility. And that the, the big stressor I'd like to point out is that they must be an Oakville resident in addition to an eligible elector. So now, before we move to the ministry's presentation, are there any questions on any of the materials presented so far?
So seeing none, uh, Maria, if I've missed any, please jump in. Uh, seeing none, I am now pleased to welcome uh, Bridget Foster and Verity Martin from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs to present on election campaign finances. Okay, can everyone hear me now? We can hear you. Okay. Okay. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Verity Martin. I'm the Municipal Advisor for Halton Region with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I'd also like to introduce my colleague Bridget Foster, who will be helping me to answer all of your questions at the end of this presentation. I'd also like to say thank you to Andrea and the rest of the staff present and the Town of Oakville in general for inviting us back to give a more focused session on campaign finance. Finally, I'd like to say thank you and congratulations to all of you for taking an interest in municipal governance. Municipal councils play an important role and the more engagement makes for a stronger government. This presentation will focus on campaign finance for candidates and third party advertisers. Some of the information will be quite dense and I encourage you to refer back to this presentation and the ministry provided guides as you work through your campaigns. A few notes before I begin. First, these slides are not intended to be relied upon for legal purposes, nor am I qualified to provide legal advice. Any legal matter should still be referred to legal counsel. Additionally, there will be a question period at the end of the presentation. If a question arises, I ask that you please note it down and wait until the question period at the end. Next slide, please. All right, I've gone over this, so we'll jump to the next one. So this is a brief overview of what I will cover tonight. As I move through the deck, I want you to remember that the primary goal of these campaign finance rules is to ensure that campaigns raise and spend money in a manner that is transparent. The best thing that you can do for yourself is to stay organized and stick to these rules. If you're unsure of something, we are here to help you. We can answer any questions that you might have, but just if you're unsure, I would encourage you to double check. Next slide. Now, as we are approaching the registration deadline, I expect the majority of you have already registered. I hope that you have now reviewed your financial forms, the, the ones that you will be expected to file at the end of your campaign. And if you have not yet looked at them, I would encourage you to do so as soon as possible, particularly before you start spending any money. Another of your first campaign tasks, if you intend to collect and spend any amount of money during your campaign, is to open a campaign-specific bank account. It does not matter what kind of bank account it is, but it must be entirely dedicated to campaign purposes. We do not recommend that you reuse a campaign account from a previous election. Only in the case of acclamations and campaigns where no funds are raised or spent is there no need for an account. Once you have a campaign account, you can start to accept contributions. Campaign contributions are monies, goods, and services given to a candidate for their election campaign. Trade unions and corporations are not eligible to contribute to candidates' campaigns, although they can participate in the election as third-party advertisers or make contributions to third-party advertising campaigns. Municipalities must establish rules and procedures regarding the use of municipal or local board resources during the campaign period. This must be passed by May 1st in the election year. This will encourage accountability and transparency, so please ensure you are aware of the municipality's policy in this regard, particularly if you are an incumbent running for re-election. The practice of municipalities providing candidate contact information on their website is not a contribution. Next slide. Candidates can only accept contributions from individuals who are normally residents of Ontario and from themselves and their spouse. Please remember that it is the responsibility of candidates to ensure that contributions are only accepted from eligible contributors and that contributors are aware of their contribution limits. Third-party advertisers may accept contributions from individuals normally residing in Ontario, trade unions that hold bargaining rights for employees in Ontario, and corporations that carry on business in Ontario. Next slide. This slide provides some information on who candidates and third-party advertisers cannot accept contributions from. 
As mentioned previously, only third-party advertisers can accept contributions from corporations and unions. The value of services provided by volunteers is generally not considered to be a contribution. However, if a volunteer provides a service for which they are usually paid, the market value of the service must be recorded as contribution and is a campaign expense. To clarify, if your friend is a professional web designer and they build your website for you for free, you must record the regular fee that they would charge as a contribution and issue a receipt. If you have a friend who is an interior designer and they like to build websites for fun, they can help you design your website and you do not need to record it as a contribution. The golden rule is if they would normally charge someone for the service they are providing, the service is a contribution. These types of contributions are also subject to contribution limits, so please keep this in mind. Next slide. Campaign contributions, as I've mentioned previously, are monies, goods, and services given to a candidate for their election campaign. This includes an amount charged for admission to a fundraising function, any amount you or your spouse contribute to your campaign, both of which contribute to your self-funding limit, the profit generated from goods and services sold for a higher than market price and for over $25 as a fundraising function, the difference between the market price for a good or service and the price paid. So if you have a friend who prints t-shirts for $6 a shirt and they sell them to you for $2 a shirt, you would claim $4 per shirt as a contribution and the $2 per shirt and the full $6 per shirt as a campaign expense. Any unpaid but guaranteed balance in respect to a loan is also a cam campaign contribution from yourself. If, and you do need to, to keep an eye on that, but we'll talk about loans a little bit more shortly. Cash contributions may only be accepted up to $25, and only in the case of a pass the hat collection at an event may be made anonymously. All contributions in excess of $25 must be made by check, money order, or any other method that clearly shows where the funds came from, such as an e-transfer. You must issue a receipt for all contributions, accepting anonymous cash donations made during the Pass the Hat collection, and this includes contributions made via the purchase of a ticket for a fundraising event. Receipts must include the name and address of the contributor, the amount, and the date. You may also wish to include contribution limits on here as it is your responsibility to ensure that people are not exceeding their contribution limits. I encourage you to be meticulous in your tracking of contributions. Take some time to sit down with, by yourself or with your team, however many people you have working on this campaign, create some methods, put together some spreadsheets, put together some policies, determine who can make, who can buy things, who can contribute to the spreadsheet, who is in charge of tracking each of these things, who ensures the receipts go out, and then stick to them. If you set very clear rules in place and you have methods in place and you have your spreadsheets, you will have a much easier time sitting down to do your financial statements at the end of the day. It is very important that you are able to demonstrate where all of your money came from and where it was spent. Act as though at the end of this, you are guaranteed to land in front of a compliance audit committee. Be very, very careful. Next slide, please. The limit on contribution limits to any one candidate or registered third-party advertiser is $1,200, except for City of Toronto mayoral candidates, in which case the amount is $2,500. The individual contribution amount has increased from $750 to $1,200, but the aggregate amount of $5,000, which is the total amount someone can donate to candidates running in the same election, stays the same. Remember, this is applicable to both money and service contributions. Your videographer friend cannot provide you with more than $1,200 worth of their services at a fair market value. Candidates and third-party advertisers are required to inform contributors of their contribution limits. You may want to include the limits on receipts provided to the contributors. When you receive a contribution on a joint account check, you must determine which of the jointed parties are making the contribution for receiving purposes. If both wish to make individual contributions, they must provide separate checks and you must provide them with separate receipts. You are required to return any contribution accepted in contravention of the Municipal Elections Act as soon as you learn that it was an ineligible contribution. If you cannot return the contribution, you must turn it over to the clerk. Next slide, please. Any cash, goods, or services contributed to your campaign by you and your spouse count towards your self-funding limit. Self-funding limits for municipal council candidates are based on the number of electors voting for the office to a maximum of $25,000 per candidate. The formula for calculating your limit is on the slide, which you can refer back to at any time. 
the clerk will also let you know what your self-funding limit is twice. First, when you file your nomination, and again, when the voters list is finalized in September. The higher of these two limits is final. There are no self-funding limits for school board candidates or third-party advertisers. If you choose to take out a personal loan to kickstart your campaign and it is not repaid in full with money raised, the remaining balance is considered to be a contribution and it will count towards your self-funding limit. Next slide, please. You are permitted to obtain a personal loan to kickstart your campaign. Now this must be obtained from a official money loaning agency. So you can't receive a loan from your family members or from any corporate accounts you have access to. You also cannot loan a campaign your own funds. A loan is not considered a campaign expense nor is paying it back, but any interest on the loan is a campaign expense and must be noted in the financial statements. It is important to note that if you take out a loan and you are unable to raise sufficient funds to pay back the loan, you are personally responsible for paying back the loan and that amount will contribute to your self-funding limit. This is true regardless of whether or not you win the election. Because of this, I would encourage you not to contribute both the full value of your self-funding limit and take out a loan. You have no way of knowing how much money you will raise and you don't want to put yourself in a position where you have to pay back some of the money yourself and you have no room left in your self-funding limit. Next slide. Now that we've established what counts as a campaign contribution, let's talk about campaign expenses. Campaign expenses, oh, sorry, we've got spending limits again. Uh, let's, this just goes through the spending limit, limit formulas, uh, but we can jump through that. So next slide, please. And we will skip through that one too. Apologies, this is our first time with this deck. All right, third party advertisers also have spending limits, which will also be provided by the clerk upon registration. They do have general two general spending limits. So the general spending limit of what they're allowed to spend during the election, as well as a separate limit related to parties and expressions of appreciation after the close of voting. Next slide. All right, now we're going to talk about campaign expenses. So campaign expenses are those costs incurred by the candidate or on the candidate's behalf during their campaign by a third party or by a third party advertiser during their campaign. This includes the replacement of value goods retained by the person, individual, corporation or trade union from any previous election in the municipality and used in the current election. For example, election signs. If you are reusing signs from a previous campaign, you must claim the amount it would have cost to purchase those signs now as a campaign expense. Secondly, the value contributions of goods or services. So if your lawyer friend provides you with $800 worth of legal advice, you must both record this $800 as contribution for which a receipt is issued and note it as a campaign expense. Also audit and accounting fees, interest and loans under section 88.17, any fees taken by a fundraising website, which would count as a campaign expense, meaning if you raise $100 on GoFundMe and after fees are taken, you take home $98, you would record $98 in contributions and $2 in campaign expenses. The cost of holding fundraising functions. The cost of holding parties and making other expressions of appreciation after the close of voting. For a candidate, expenses relating to a recount or proceedings under section 83. Expenses related to a compliance audit. Expenses that are incurred by a candidate with a disability or a registered third party who is an individual with a disability are directly related to the disability and would not have been incurred but for the election to which the expense relate. And the cost of election campaign advertisements or third party advertisements as the case may be. Some of the expenses I have listed would be incurred after election day, so ensure that you are properly accounted and budgeted for these expenses. The nomination fee is no longer an expense and it is not included on the financial disclosure form. Next slide, please. Only nominated persons or third party advertisers can incur expenses during the campaign period. Payment of any campaign expense must be drawn from the campaign account and receipts providing the details and proof of payment must be obtained. If you wish to make purchases using a credit card, you do not need to open a campaign specific credit card, but you must ensure that you can clearly prove that these items were paid for from the campaign account. Make sure to keep notes and clear records as evidence that the expenses were reimbursed from the campaign funds in a campaign account. 
All expenses must be reported in the financial relevant financial disclosure form to be filed with the clerk by the candidate or the third party advertiser. If you have leftover inventory at the end of this campaign, which you want to keep, it becomes your personal property and storing it for future use would not be considered a campaign expense. Next slide. This slide outlines the only expenses which are not subject to the spending limit. Expenses related to fundraising functions are exempt from the spending limit, but in order to qualify as a fundraising function, an event must have the raising money as its primary purpose. The financial disclosure forms in include a dedicated section for fundraising functions, so do make sure that you are being careful. Campaign events at which incidental fundraising takes place do not qualify as fundraising functions. Similarly, a brochure promoting awareness of a candidate that contains contact information to make co campaign contributions does not qualify as a fundraising function. Essentially, if you will not be able to clearly demonstrate that the primary function of an event was fundraising, follow the expense and contribution rules for a regular campaign event. Expenses that were subject to the spending limit if incurred before voting day are not subject to the spending limit if incurred after voting day. This does not permit you to play with your expenses. If a purchase was pre-election and the invoice comes in after the election, you must use it as a campaign, as an expense subject to the spending limit. Next slide, please. It is important that you ensure you are fully aware of your responsibilities regarding election spending and fundraising. You are your own chief financial officer and you are liable for any ineligible contributions, misuse of funds, or any other violation of campaign finance rules. I encourage you to familiarize yourself with the financial sections of the Municipal Elections Act, review the candidates and third party advertiser guides in detail, and review the financial statements you will be required to file before you spend any money or accept any contributions. When you're putting that spreadsheet together, it's really helpful if you take a look at your at the form and you automatically categorize all of those things into the correct categories. And then when you go to file the form, they're already there for you. We have already mentioned this, but I do want to stress if you intend to spend any amount of money, even if you're just buying t-shirts for volunteers, you have to open a campaign specific account. Next slide. You must maintain complete and accurate records of every financial transaction during the course of your campaign. If anyone is helping you with your campaign finances, please make sure they are they have read the guides and the forms and they are very clear on exactly what the rules are and the different ways in which contributions, campaign income, fundraising events and spending limits are treated. You may wish to formalize record keeping policies and procedures for your campaign. This could include things like receipt templates, tracking documents, spreadsheets, tracking contributions, expenses and campaign income. Put in the legwork now and get yourself organized as your campaign will run much smoother. All contributions and expenses are to be accounted for and disclosed by the candidate on the relevant prescribed financial form. All candidates and third party advertisers are required to keep all campaign financial records until after the next regular election and after the next council takes their seats after November 15th, 2026. These rules apply whether you are elected or not. Next slide. This slide outlines some of the best practices for keeping your campaign finances organized. While I hope that none of you become subject to a compliance audit review, as I said before, I encourage you to behave as though you will. Remember, all of your records must be maintained until the next council is in place in 2026. Next slide, please. Now, when you file your financial statement, this is what closes your campaign. So you don't have to file it immediately after the election. So if you need to do a bit more fundraising or you want to spend a bit more money, you are able to do so. But you must make sure that you file that financial statement before 2 p.m. on Friday, March 31st, on 2023. If you filed a nomination form, you must file a form for it, even if you withdrew your nomination or you were acclaimed. If you registered as a third party advertiser, you must complete form eight. A candidate may resubmit a financial statement to correct an error up until the filing deadline. However, they cannot withdraw a financial statement without filing a new one. If you think that you may be unable to file your financial statement by the deadline, you may apply to the Superior Court of Justice for an extension before March 31st, 2023. 
If the court grants the extension, you will receive the refund of your nomination fee if you file by the deadline given to you by the court. If you have not filed your financial statement by the deadline, you may file your financial statement within 30 days after the deadline if you pay the municipality a $500 late fee. This grace period ends at 2 p.m. on Monday, May 1st, 2023, and please note that you will not receive a refund of your nomination fee if you file during the 30-day grace period. Next slide, please. If your campaign spending exceeds $10,000, even by a cent, you must appoint an auditor to complete an audit before the financial statement filing deadline. So make sure you book this well in advance and make sure that you have budgeted for this. The auditor must be licensed under the Public Accounting Act 2004. And please keep in mind that these campaign statements are public documents and they will be available for members of the public to inspect and the public may scrutinize them. So please make sure to be accurate, clear, and detailed. The more transparent you are, the less likely it is that questions will, will be raised after the fact. Next slide, please. Candidates can file their financial documents at any time after voting day to January 3rd, adjusted from December 31st, as that falls on a Sunday this year. Filing the financial statements ends your campaign period. This makes it easier for acclamations and campaigns where little or no expenses are incurred, but please remember that you do have until the deadline. You don't have to do it immediately. So if you have some financial matters that you need to wrap up, you do have time to do so. Clerks will be required to report whether candidates have met their financial filing obligation and publish that report on the municipal website or in another electronic form. This must be done by April 30th in the case of regular elections or 90 days within 90 days of a by-election. Next slide. Remember that the nomination fee is only refundable if the financial statement is filed on time. If a candidate or third party advertiser feels they will not meet the deadline, they can apply to the courts or they can apply to the grace for that grace period, provided that they are paying that $500 late fee plus accepting the loss of their nomination fee. So it is very, very important that you do file this on time. You don't want the hassle. This is why it's so important to stay organized at the beginning because then you will be able to wrap up very quickly. Next slide. Now, remember, if you have switched your campaign, so let's say you initially decided you wanted to run as a ward counselor, but then you decide, say you wanted to run in ward three, but then you decided you wanted to run in ward four as you were getting more support. Because those are elected by ward, you have to file two financial statements. However, if you were initially running for something that's elected at large, so elected by the municipality as a whole, you can transfer all of your initial finances to the new campaign and you only have to file once. If you decided to file a second nomination, you need to make sure that all the financial information from your initial campaign is properly accounted for. You need to double check the guides, check in with us, even check in with the clerk, just make sure that you've accounted for this correctly. And also make sure that if you are filing two separate financial statements, that the initial, the initial financial statement reflects the end of the campaign on the day that it ended. Next slide, please. Now, when you're filing your financial statement, both candidates and third party advertisers with campaign surpluses must pay the entire amount to the clerk. The one exception is if you and your spouse made any contributions to your campaign, you are able to refund the amount of your contribution from the campaign surplus. So for example, if you contributed $1,500 and you have a surplus of $2,000, you can refund yourself $1,500 and the remaining $500 must be turned over to the clerk. You cannot refund any other contributions. The clerk is required to place surplus monies and trust for used for use by the candidate or the third party advertiser if they need it for a compliance audit. If neither the candidate nor the third party advertiser require the funds for these purposes, they become the property of the municipality. Next slide. Now I mentioned the compliance audit a couple of times and now I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about what that committee is. So every council and school board must establish compliance audit committee. Members of the committee cannot be members of the council or school board. They cannot be an employee or a candidate in the election. 
and they cannot be a registered third-party advertiser. The clerk will review contributions reported on candidates' financial forms and prepare a report for consideration by the Compliance Audit Committee if a contributor appears to have exceeded the contribution limits. This process is not connected to the compliance audit process. If it is apparent to the clerk that a contributor has exceeded one or more of the contribution limits, the clerk would report this to the committee, which would meet to determine whether they want to proceed with legal action. Any electors entitled to vote in an election may apply for a compliance audit committee, even if the candidate has not filed a financial statement. The application must be in writing and set out the electors' reasons for why they believe the Municipal Elections Act has been contravened. It must be submitted to the municipal clerk or the secretary of the school board within 90 days of the filing deadline. The Compliance Audit Committee will consider the application and decide whether to retain an auditor or to undertake a compliance audit of the candidate's financial return. Next slide. <clears throat> once, a candidate, once a complaint has been filed, the Compliance Audit Committee is required to review and provide a brief written reason for its decision. Compliance audit committee meetings are required to be open to the public, but the committee may deliberate in private. <clears throat> the written reasons for the committee's decision shall be given to the candidate and the clerk with whom the candidate filed their nomination. The secretary of the school board and the applicant and the applicant. If an audit occurs, the report must be circulated to the same individuals. If the compliance audit determines that there has been an apparent contravention of the Municipal Elections Act, the committee will decide whether to proceed with legal action. Decisions of the committee may be appealed to the Superior Court of Justice. Additionally, any person who believes the, that a candidate has contravened the Municipal Elections Act may proceed with legal action without having first ob obtained a compliance audit. Next slide. Now, the Municipal Elections Act sets out an offense consult, constituting a corrupt practice. A corrupt practice is something very different than a, a complaint to the Compliance Audit Committee. It is criminal and it is handled by a special unit of the OPP. Those are outlined here on this slide. Next slide, please. This just goes over some of the penalties that you would face as an individual candidate or third party advertiser if you contravene the Municipal Elections Act. Please take this seriously. These penalties are applied and you don't want to have to deal with them. Next slide. All right, now I've referenced a couple of these resources throughout the slide and they are available to you and I encourage you to review them at your leisure. The guides in particular are incredibly helpful. Next slide. And finally, it is now time for questions. And I will say before we dive into that, that if we end the session and you have a question occurred to you later on or if you have a question in three months please feel free to reach out to me i'm here to help you at any point of your campaign okay thank you so much uh, verity and bridget for that presentation that was great uh, we do have a couple questions uh, so we did have one question that we were just able to answer, but for the benefit of all the participants, I will ask it. It had to do with spending limit. It said, what is the spending limit for school board campaigns? So we did just, uh, and jump in please if you have anything to add, but we did respond saying each school board trustee position has a different spending limit as it is based on eligible electors in the ward or the wards, and all limits are based on the legislated formula that Verity spoke to. Right. So another question that came in, uh, if a candidate has the expertise to design their own website, can they? Would they still have to apply a market value to it and submit it as a self-contribution to their campaign? Yes and yes. As you are a professional, you are making a contribution of a service to yourself. So make sure you are still noting that down at market value and it is part of your self-funding limit. It's also an expense. Okay, great. So I don't see any other questions that have come through. Uh, so again, I would like to very much thank uh, Bridget Foster and Verity Martin from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing for joining us. Uh, please do stay on if you if, if you can. Uh, we have staff from Municipal Enforcement Services uh, here and I just saw another question pop up. So excuse me one moment. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a question with respect to receiving donations. 
Uh, I noticed some prior campaign receipts include commercial addresses. I assume we should only receipt someone's residential address. As contributions to candidates can only be made by people and not corporations, a best practice would certainly be to not put corporate addresses on those campaigns as it may appear that the corporation has made the donation. That's great, thank you. Uh, so I will uh, let the attendees know that, that if there are any other questions that come up even throughout the, uh, the election sign presentation, please do still uh, type it in the Q&A chat and we are happy to, to address it afterwards. Uh, so again, thank you very much to Bridget and Verity from Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, so now um, I'd like to now turn over the presentation to uh, the town's Municipal Enforcement Services staff, Caitlin Jones and Margaret Boswell, uh, to speak to election signs and the town's election sign bylaw. Good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Caitlin Jones, and I'm the Supervisor of Municipal Enforcement here at the Town of Oakville. This evening, I am going to be reviewing the requirements surrounding election signs, um, and there will be a brief period of time at the end of this presentation to go over any questions, if there are any, and I will also highlight that if um, any of the questions aren't able to be answered, or if anything comes up, um, we can make sure to have those addressed uh, at a later time as well to make sure everybody's questions get answered. So we can start off by providing a little bit of background. Um, so in 2014, the Halton region amended their sign bylaw to restrict the placement of election signs on any regional road allowance. In 2018, third party advertising was introduced through changes to the Municipal Elections Act. And in January of this year, the election sign section of the sign bylaw was reviewed by council who confirmed the current regulations and approved the prohibition of the placement of election signs along the frontage of town properties where a cenotaph is currently or may subsequently be located. If you wanna learn more about any of the uh, specifics of any of the reports, they are available online at oakville.ca. Okay, so candidates can use signs to advertise for their candidacy. In order to do this, they will have to obtain a, an election sign application to be submitted. Um, that would include the application form, including a sign deposit of $205, which can be submitted to Service Oakville. If signs are placed before an election sign deposit is paid, the signs will be removed. So that's important to note. Um, and also, I know it's already been mentioned and will be again, but no signs may be erected prior to to September 9th. Okay, and so what is an election sign? An election sign as defined in the sign bylaw um, means a double or single face sign advertising or promoting the election of a candidate for public office in a federal, provincial, or municipal election and includes signs promoting the position of a person registered to campaign with respect to a question on a ballot and third party election signs. Okay, so getting into placement. Election signs can only be placed on town owned arterial road allowances and private property with the owner's approval of that property. Um, signs are prohibited on municipal property, including community or recreation centers, parks, on a road allowance abutting any town owned building, uh, and only permitted in the ward in which the candidate is representing. Um, signs may not be placed on uh, town trees or tree supports, utility poles, official signs um, or official sign structures, town fences, regional roads, and again along the frontage of properties where a cenotaph is located. Okay, so here I just wanted to bring to your attention the uh, ward maps that you were provided when you registered. Um, the, only the streets that are marked in red are able to have election signs installed. 
all other streets would not be allowed. Um, this does not obviously include private property, uh, for example, in a resident's front yard. Um, they would be permitted to have a sign, but just to be mindful of that not being on the boulevard because it may be removed. Um, each ward does have their own map. Um, and again, they were provided in packages. However, it will also be available on the elections.oakville.ca website. In your candidates package, we have included this postcard that should be shown to your team who are putting up the signs. Um, these are the restrictions where we um, that were put in place for safety reasons. So any signs placed within these areas will be moved. So just to take a look at this, we just wanna make sure that they're not placed within 30 meters of the intersection on any medians or islands within 1.5 meters of the edge of the road around fire hydrants. Uh, driveway access points, um, as well as around bus stops. Okay, um, so just to go over the type of sign supports that are approved, the town uh, approves wood posts uh, two by two uh, inches or less that can be used for larger signs and then the metal um, posts quarter inch diameter or less either in the H or U shape um, are approved for use. And just to note, once your campaign account is open, you can purchase your signs, but again, nothing can go up until September 9th. Um, and then for signs that are uh, posts that are not approved would be something in the style of, uh, for example, one of the U-bar posts or a T-bar posts. Um, these can easily damage underground public utilities such as gas lines, hydro, communication cables, et cetera, and repairs to damage underground utilities can be very costly, so we just don't approve that. Okay, so election signs are now being permitted on town property where paid advertising is available. Payment for these are required. This could include, uh, could include bus shelters, buses, rink boards, and TV screen ads within community centers. But please also, also note that paid advertising signs will still be subject to the sign bylaw. For example, signs cannot be displayed at a voting location during the established voting hours, which includes 48 hours prior to voting day, as well as any advanced voting days. Okay, and to touch in, I know we've spoken about this, but um, third party election signs, third party advertising refers to advertisements or other materials that support, promote, or oppose a candidate. Third party in this context is a person or entity who is not a candidate. Uh, third party advertising is separate from any candidate's campaign and must be done independently from a candidate. Any advertisements or materials that are made and distributed by a candidate or under a candidate's direction are part of the candidate's campaign. Um, third party advertising is a way for those outside of the candidate's campaign to express support of or opposition to and to try to persuade voters to vote a certain way. Uh, any third party ad, uh, election signs must be displayed within the ward in which the candidate is running as well and regardless of whether they are opposing or supporting. Okay, so each third party election sign shall include the following information, the name of the registered third party, the municip municipality where the third party is registered, a telephone number, mailing address, or email address um, at which the registered third party may be contacted regarding the third party election sign. Okay, getting into enforcement. So sign enforcement is managed through requests for enforcement. Um, so both reactively and on a proactive basis. Uh, any complaints will be submitted to Service Oakville by calling our main line or emailing service at oakville.ca. Once a complaint is received by staff, it is dispatched to a mobile compliance officer to investigate. Signs erected contrary to the bylaw will be removed and will be made available for pickup. Okay, so if anything uh, is removed, sign uh, can be retrieved via appointments. Um, so signs can be picked up on an appointment basis by contacting Service Oakville um, at the main line or again via email. And just to note, $51 will be deducted from your sign deposit for each appointment scheduled prior to the election day. Um, some of the requirements for retrieving signs um, would be to show proof of ID. We obviously want to know who's picking up the signs. Candidate or a designated person must show photo ID at the time of pickup and the completion of a pickup authorization form. The candidate or designate would be required to sign off on the signs picked up. 
The location for the pickup of signs is at a town facility located at 125 Randall Street, um, which is previously a fire hall. And then after the election, candidates have up to 72 hours after voting day to remove their election signs. Um, mobile compliance officers will begin removing any signs found on the road allowance after that 72 hour period. And $11 will be charged per sign retrieved after that 72 hour period, um, which uh, the amount would be deducted from the sign deposit prior to the refund being issued. So that is all I have for you today, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Hi, Caitlin, thank you so much for your presentation. So we do have, um, we do have one question. What is the earliest that an election sign can be erected? Of course, the application fee and the application, uh, and the application were approved. Yes, so in that case, it would be September 9th. Would and I do know, yeah, we get this uh, question a lot and correct me if I'm wrong, but 12.01 a.m. on September 9th is fair game. Would you, would you agree, Caitlin? I would agree, yes. <laughs> okay. okay. We'll just give it a quick second just to see if there are any other questions. And uh, I will invite anyone, any other participants at this point, if you do have any other questions, even unrelated to election signs, any questions at all pertaining to elections in general, please, uh, please uh, type in the Q&A or if you wish to raise your hand, please do that. If you don't mind, Andrew, I was just going to jump in just to mention as well that um, candidates can start um, submitting their deposit forms anytime now in preparation for that, you know, 1201 drop. So um, please be, feel free to, you know, come in to service Oakville. Um, the form is also available online, so it is accessible. But if you have any questions, of course, as Caitlin mentioned, to just call Service Oakville at 905-845-6601, and they will be able to answer your calls and or uh, pass your query over to enforcement staff to assist you further. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, and for those candidates who are registered, uh, you will have your sign package and sign deposit form available on the candidate portal if you are looking for it. But as Margaret said, it's also available online. So uh, with that, um, I don't see any other questions, but again, please submit them if you do have any, uh, but that does conclude the presentation from Municipal Enforcement Services. Uh, thank you so much, Caitlin and Margaret. Um, and this does conclude the town's August 11th candidate information session. A uh, big thank you to Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing reps, Municipal Enforcement Services staff, and all of you participating with us virtually today. And I did see a question come in. Uh, so this is for Municipal Enforcement, uh, just with respect to signs. Can street stores post a sign on their windows? I believe, and maybe Margaret can put in, uh, some information on this, but if it's on their private property, um, again, it would still be subject to not being prior to the September 9th component. And it would have to be within the ward. <laughs> now, I wouldn't recommend you put it right in the sign. Any signs that would be considered a window sign, which is, would then be um, subject to appropriate sign um, regulations. But if it is stepped back, it would have to be well set back into the store. Then, then it would be considered then more so a fixture in the store. Um, but I would certainly encourage um, if you are looking for more information and actively looking to post election signs in your store, um, perhaps reach out to us. In addition, uh, what we can do is add some more information as well on our website, just to speak to that point, because it's something that is a new question to us, but if you're at thinking it, maybe someone else is. So I think it's in important information to have available. Thank you so much. Um, so seeing, seeing no more, uh, what I will invite the participants to do is if you do have any questions following this presentation, please don't hesitate to send them directly to us, elections at oakville.ca, 
or townclerk at oakville.ca. Uh, we're happy to address those questions and we can even post some of them to the website along with the recording of the session, which will be posted to the town's website. Uh, so thank you again to all of uh, all of our presenters tonight, to all of the attendees. I wish you all good luck, and I do remind you that myself, Vicky, and the entire election team, we are here to support you. Thank you for attending. <laughs>